them welcome. When I say no justice, you say no peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. Welcome everyone to tonight's 100 Days of Justice Community Town Hall meeting. My name is Walter Hill, and I'm here to welcome you. Our event has been put together by the St. Louis County Reform Coalition in partnership with Color of Change. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. My name is Walter Hill. I traveled the streets of the county and heard from the people. Each time I visited with someone, I heard about their pain. Their pain because they had endured months of jail time for trivial offenses. Their pain because Mike Brown. Their pain because of Mike Brown. So we'd be remiss right now to take a moment of silence for the late Mike Brown. Their pain because Mike Brown was shot down and the prosecutor's office failed to pursue a serious case against the officer who took his life. Their pain because they endured over 28 years with a prosecutor who supported policies that treated people differently because of the color of their skin. Yes. But change has begun. Change has begun. Yeah. You hear me? Can you a round of applause for change? Yeah. He defeated the coming bomb of color by setting for the agenda for reform, which included the expansion of diversion programs and treatment programs for nonviolent offenders and committed rejection of the death penalty. Compassion, never to seek a death penalty. It has been 100 days since Wesley Bell was sworn in, and we were here to celebrate his success, provide community input, and seek answers for changes still unresolved. Tonight's event is the first in a series of public events that we plan to hold to facilitate open and regular communication with the community, just to have a conversation. Just to have a conversation. A few thank yous. We're being hosted tonight at the Sheraton, the Great Sheraton. They had great drinks and food. <laughs> Thank you to all the staff here for their kind assistance over the last few weeks. Thanks to all the community organizations who have come together to cultivate, elevate, and amplify tonight's important discussion on criminal justice in St. Louis County. Yes. Yes. These organizations have joined together as a St. Louis County Reform Coalition. When you see SLCRC, that's what we're talking about. Throughout the program, you will hear from their members and constituents as they ask questions of the prosecutor, Wesley Bell himself. The prosecutor is here, y'all. We're going to ask him and engage a conversation with the prosecutor himself. That's powerful. These new policies are highly impacted their lives. So these questions will cover three topics mass incarceration, criminalization of poverty and child support, capital punishment, and the conviction integrity. I'm with Color Change. I'm gonna quickly talk about how community engagement is gonna work during this forum. As Walter mentioned, you can text your question. We have a text code to 225568. We have a team throughout the duration of this event that's gonna be monitoring those questions as they come in, and they're gonna do their best to select the questions that are most representative of what folks wanna know. And, um, she runs uh, Missouri Faith Voices. She's a community organizer. Uh, she's a spirit person. And uh, Cassandra Gould, cool, y'all give her a hand. Um, but before I had a DR in front of my name or before anyone even imagined calling me Reverend, I was just a mother um, who raised her children in St. Louis County. Um, like many of us, um, my activism did not start on August 9th, but there was something that broke on the inside of me. Um, I, was, I am a dual resident of St. Louis County in Jefferson City, Missouri, where I pastor a church. Uh, people ask me where I live, and I tell them on Highway 70. Uh, but um, on August the 9th, like many, I'm scrolling through Facebook. I just got off a plane, got back to Jefferson City. And I see the images, and I'm like, yeah, is this a hoax or what is this? 
And then people started to text. And when I saw uh, that it was um, in Canfield, I remember, not that I really had to remember, um, my now deceased mother-in-law lived in Canfield Green, 2913 Copper Creek Road, permanent people. And my children played in Canfield Green. Um, 2009, 2014, they were adults. But I realized that that could have been my son, could have been my daughter. And I knew that, like other clergy and activists, um, and I kind of got that backwards, I knew once the young people called us on the carpet um, that I had to stay in the streets. I also remember feeling really hopeless on August 15th, the day that the tanks came out. And I thought to myself, I never imagined being in the military and I wonder if this was what like Beirut was like. And I also thought to myself as a faith leader and a clergy person, like how could I do more? Then I didn't know exactly what that more looked like, but I knew that it was not acceptable to just allow black blood to run through the streets over and over and over and over and over again. And to just go to the teddy bear and flower down and then go back to the same way of being. So like many people stayed in the streets, I met really awesome people like Kayla Reed and uh, young organizers who were out there and I knew that I was from a generation of respectability and that uh, one of the most respectable people that we think of, Dr. King, was as dead as Malcolm X was and as Mike Brown was. Didn't know exactly what I would do, but I knew I would keep doing something. Fast forward to the night of the non-indictment. I knew in my heart that that's exactly what would happen. Um, as a leader, I wasn't the executive director of Faith Voices. I was just a, a pastor who understood that my role was, the, the streets were as much as my pulpit as um, a sanctuary was. Um, got a call earlier that day from the then governor. Whenever a politician calls you before an announcement, it is not going to go your way. Um, and went to the streets with my gas mask, my Pepto-Bismol, make sure that I didn't, uh, wasn't hurt from tear gas. Caring people, doing pastoral care when people were just falling out in despair. That night, November 2014, I said, I don't know how and I don't know what it's going to take, but if Mickey Mouse runs for prosecutor, I am going to do everything that is necessary to make sure that Mickey Mouse wins so that there would be change in my children's lifetime and now in my grandchildren's life. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So the mic is working? Okay, good, good. So first I want to thank you all for being here. Um, we have just finished 100 days in office and nothing fell apart, right? <laughs> <laughs> now the county didn't stop working. Um, and, and so, and so I, you know, I, I do want to start off with the kind of a summary of, of what we've been doing and then also talk about things that we're doing, that we plan on doing in the future. But we can't talk too much about what we're going to do in the future because that has a lot to do with the conversations that we have in venues like these. Um, I, think it's the, I think it's the role of an elected official to get out and talk to the people that you serve. That's what public service is about. <laughs> We have been planning this for our first 100 days to be the first of, of many town halls, but unfortunately it actually happens to be the second one because we were invited out to a town hall in South County, and I believe if you're going to represent St. Louis County, you have to represent everyone. That's right. right? That's right. So one of the state representatives from that area um, invited us out, and, and we went out and we talked, and, and we had some really good conversations. And, and I keep finding out the same things, with, with, regardless if I go to South County, West County, North County, or wherever, 
is that people just want to be treated fairly. They want to be heard. They want to know that their voice is heard. And so that's what we're going to make sure that we that we do and continue to do. Um, and I, have, I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Thank you for coming. And some I haven't met, so I hope to meet you, um, if not tonight, some other time. But um, again, I want to make sure that I um, let you all know how much we appreciate you being here. And so let's talk about the, the, the past 100 days. This is actually 101. So we're starting the second, the second day, the second 100 days. And so we've been focused on, a, on, on several things. One is changing the culture of the office, reorganization of the office, because the prosecutor's office has, like any entity, has limited resources. And we want to make sure that we are allocating those resources in the most effective manner to make sure that people are being treated fairly in that St. Louis County residents are safe. Um, because keep in mind, I am the prosecutor. And so that means I'm not always going to make you happy because our, whole, our goal is justice. And wherever that takes us. Um, and so one thing that we wanted to do is we want to prioritize our resources toward the serious and violent crimes that actually matter. And we've made progress by, by being more efficient at targeting violent crimes with specific focus on homicides, sex crimes, domestic violence, and violent felonies. What we have, and what we created in this office, one, was an individualized um, domestic violence uh, unit. Prior to, the, the, the attorneys that handled domestic violence had, a, had an array of different types of cases. Well, now what we want, we know that this is a serious matter. We know that so many people don't get the attention that they deserve, um, and we want to make sure that we have attorneys who are passionate about, about domestic violence as well as sex crimes. Um, but also, one thing that we noticed coming into the office when we were doing our assessments is that homicides were kind of spread around to all the different attorneys in the office. And let me, let me give you an anecdote. Um, we make a point, personally, me I should say, I make a point. Any victim of a, any victim's family of a homicide that wants to meet with me, I meet with them personally. Um, and I think that's important. Sometimes um, the facts um, support something that the family doesn't agree with. Oftentimes it does, but I want them to be able to talk to me directly. And one of the things that I learned in those conversations is that First and foremost, they want to know that there's an experienced attorney representing that case, right? And we found that there were attorneys who had, had little to no trial, trial experience and they were getting assigned homicides. And so what we've done is we have created a homicide unit. And so we are in the process of transitioning our, our, the overwhelming majority of our homicides to the, to the few attorneys in that unit and they're our most experienced attorneys to make sure that those cases are handled in the manner, in the serious manner that they, um, um, you know, they're handled seriously as they are. And so um, already, since we created that um, unit, two, three weeks ago, we've gotten 50% of our homicides within the attorneys in that unit. And then amongst the team leaders, we're talking 60%. And so as we go on, we'll have that number going up to 80 and 90%. And then we still want to train some of our younger attorneys. So some of the less serious crimes, we'll give them, we'll give them the training. We'll give them trials so they can get their experience and, and be able to handle those serious kind of, kind of crimes. Um, also, we want to better prioritize victims, which I alluded to earlier. If, if someone wants to meet with me, you know, the schedule's getting packed. However, we're going to make it happen. I think, you know, I think part of the job is being accessible. I'm not going to sit in my office all day. We're going to get out, and if you watch, follow us on social media, um, we are getting out in the office. We are, we are, whether it be schools, whether it be seniors, whether it be community meetings, we have, a, for the first time in the history of this office, a, a director of community engagement, and that's his job. And her, That, that, that's so important to me that we make sure that we're out there and that you hear us. Because one thing that I found, I'm knocking on a lot of doors. We like them, I'm knocking on personally thousands of doors. And we had a lot of people, even in this room, who also knocked on a lot of doors. And, and, and one thing that, um, one thing that I, I, I realized is that 
um, through these conversations is a lot of people didn't really understand the role of the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. They didn't know exactly what the prosecutor did. And, 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 I, and we want to let people behind the curtain. We want transparency. We want people to know what we do. Um, well, Ron, um, sometime last year, I was pulled over leaving a residential community. I stay in Forreston. Um, a boy, the officer approached my vehicle. He got my ID and my insurance and took it back to his squad car. I just had no idea why I was even flagged. Um, when he came back to my car, he had tickets for a for running a stop sign and for not wearing my seatbelt, which I was both wearing my seatbelt and had stopped at the stop sign. Um, but there was absolutely no reasoning with the officer or talking to the officer. Um, and I just want, with that data um, being presented to you, I just want to know how your office plans on handling discriminatory police traffic stops. And so I, I want to start off with an anecdote, and I appreciate that question in particular because, you know, I'm from this area, from North County, and I've been pulled over countless times, especially, you know, when I was younger. Now I don't get pulled over as much for some reason. <laughs> and I'll even, I'll even say that I, I've been pulled over so many times in my life that until I got to law school and took a crim law class, I didn't realize it was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, grew up in North County right off Hall's Ferry. Remember when some of y'all remember? Kim was probably with me on several of these occasions in the crowd now. Uh, we would get pulled over because we'd be at the movie theater, young, and sat on the curb, car searched, and you know we weren't doing anything, so we didn't think much of it. Um, but at the same time, that wasn't right. And so, this goes back to a question or a point that I made earlier is that understand my role. I cannot direct law enforcement. You don't, we're not, we don't, they don't report to me with respect to their job duties and things of that nature. But what we can do is de incentivize those types of um, um, unfair stops by the policies that we implement. And so when we talk about um, um, not prosecuting small amounts of marijuana, but well, we know that's one of the biggest uh, pretextual stop reasons for stops. Oh, I smell the aroma of marijuana in the car. You read in the police, in, in the police report. And, and so, and by not prosecuting those cases and not putting our resources and focusing focusing on those cases, we also can focus on the real cases that matter. But also, if if we're continually still getting cases that 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 uh, are about small amounts of marijuana, well, then we can start saying, well, why are you doing this? Why why are you still making these stops if you know that we're not pulling people yes. over? And 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 so again, we can't control what what, what they do, but we can't work with them. And we are going to continue to work with them, and we're going to continue to put policies in place that de-emphasize those kind of stops. And, and Sam, did you want to? Yeah, and, and I didn't introduce some of, some of the members up here of our team. So <coughs> Sam Alton is is my chief of staff. Hi, Sam. Um, I'll give him a round of applause. <laughs> Chelsea Draper is is one of the attorneys that works in the community. <laughs> also, the daughter of Missouri Supreme Court Justice George Draper. Hey. Julia Fogelberg Alton is our director of diversion. And like me, she's a former public defender, so we stole her from the public defenders office. Um, we mourn the death of Mike Brown and yes. certainly uh, want to express uh, our support of your decision to find the prosecutor, to fire the prosecutor who presented evidence in the case to the grand jury but still failed to get the indictment yes. of the police officer who shot him. Um, so yeah, you all should clap for that. Uh, if you can answer in two minutes, uh, I do that in church when people are talking, you got two minutes. Um, how will you handle future instances of police misconduct and violence? Yes. So from the, from the very beginning, I've been clear and, uh, and, I'll, and, and in no uncertain terms, 
there is a relationship that, that between prosecutors and law enforcement. Every time I walk in that office, there are officers in there applying for warrants, um, working on investigations. And let me be clear, you know, I, I, I just want to be absolutely clear. If we're going to have honest conversations, then we have to know that change involves everyone, yeah. right? And so we know a lot of officers are hardworking, honest, and we want to make sure that, you know, if, if they're in the right and they're doing their job right, we're going to have their back 100%. And if they're abusing the law and abusing rights, then they're going to be held accountable. And prosecutors will not issue criminal cases or apply for summons or warrants for failure to pay child support. The local police union complained, of course, that this new policy would further stress single parents. You responded that criminalizing non-payment can make it even harder for parents uh, under a child support order to even uh, make good on that. Um, at this time, I want to uh, call uh, Anthony McAllister. My name is Anthony McAllister, and I do am a single parent. I uh, live for my children. I've always worked. I was placed in a situation by the state of Missouri where I couldn't work anymore. For six months, I've missed payments. They have enjoyed with a belt. I've been locked up by maybe five times for this. I'm currently out on bail. You got, a, you got someone in your office, uh, Mary Myers. Bends over backwards on locking you up. Currently, they are taking child support out of my check. So I'm being charged with contempt. I did speak with your partner. He said he was going to take care of that. But I know the people still need to hear this because I'm not the only person dealing with it. That's real, man. That's real. So the question to you is moving forward after your policy. How, what would you do to ensure that this doesn't happen to anyone else in that situation? That's right. So first, like, you know, I, I, one thing I don't do well is lie, so I don't even try to. Um, and so I'm not going to blame that individual prosecutor. That prosecutor was following the lead of their boss. And that was the policies at the time. And, and I want to make sure that I'm explaining this because it can get distorted. And you know sometimes when things get reported and people have agendas, they don't necessarily report it the correct way. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about this in a manner where we can explain it. And so we are not leaving um, parents who um, are in need of financial assistance from, from, uh, an, an, from their you know, from their husband or ex-husband or what have you, we're still going to assist them. There's two ways that we can do it. We can do it by felony criminal conviction, or we can do it by civil contempt. And let me explain the difference. The same thing that Anthony's talking about is when you is that when you give that felony conviction, do you think it makes it easier or more difficult to get a job? <laughs> and, and let me. And jobs pay what? Money. Right? And child support is about what? Money. So if we want an individual to be able to help their family, they need money, which comes from a job. Y'all <laughs> <No>, sharp. <laughs> and there is one place, one place that I can think of offhand that precludes an individual from helping their family. Jail. So, if we want to help a family, why are we sending a family member to jail? So, but here's how we're still helping. We're still helping um, the, the, uh, the individual who needs support who has custody or what have you is that we're still representing them. We're just going through the civil what process. To do? How soon can we expect you to end cash bill? OK. <laughs> so like, if I open my shirt, there is not a Superman or <laughs> under here. I cannot, you have to understand my role. I cannot do that alone. Right. Having said that, what we can do, we are doing. So on day one, one of our first policies, and actually it was first, because we it, um, implemented these on day one, is Internally, in our office, we were changing our cash bill system so that CD&E felonies and misdemeanors, and let, me be, and let me clarify, CD&E felonies 
are, the, are, are by and large nonviolent felonies. Now we put an exception in there for those nonviolent felonies that involve a threat to a victim. Those don't count. But nonviolent felonies, CD&Es, not A's and B's, CD&Es and misdemeanors, we will not ask for cash bail. All right. We will not do it. All right. Thank you, sir. And that's something that we started on the day of the And I want to explain. The educator in me, I want to explain, because some people may not understand what bail is meant to do. Bail is not meant for punitive purposes. It is not meant to punish. It is to ensure the presence of the defendant throughout the proceedings. That's it, because at this point, the defendant has not been found guilty of anything. It's just an accusation. And so now, having said that, if someone is charged with a serious crime and they are a threat to the community, then they should have to sit and wait for their, their, their trial date. But if they're not a threat to the community, they need substance abuse treatment or mental health, mental health care, why are we keeping them over $500 or $1,000? Because the, the system as it is, or as it was, uh, the murderer with means is able to get out, right? You, po you, you, you set a $200,000 bond and you, you're thumping yourself on the chest like, yeah, we got him, he's not going anywhere, and then he posts the bond. And now you have someone who may have committed a murder loose on the streets. But then that low-level offender who doesn't scare anyone, who just needs help, well, they can't afford the $1,000. And they're sitting in jail. And so internally, We've all, we started that process because the prosecutor's office does carry weight. We can't do it on our own, but it does carry weight. And we've also reached out to the judges, and, and we're working with them on these policies because the Supreme Court just recently announced that they are also re re revising the cash bail in Missouri. And that's a big deal. six months before they could implement any changes on their own, but we're already working with the judge, the judges and the judiciary on implementing that now, but also being ready to go when, Ju when July comes because, um, again, as I, as I talked about before, even a short time in jail increases the likelihood of someone committing another uh, offense. And, and, and we have to implement policies that actually are productive toward what we want to accomplish, and that is less crime. We want to bring, we want to get people out working back to their job because in jail, most of us don't have jobs that don't that'll just be there if you don't show up for three weeks, right? Your rent, your work, your landlord, or your mortgage is, are they just going to leave your house there if you don't pay for a few months? Single parents, you might lose your children, right? And so. A violent offender, yeah, they're going to have to be held accountable. But non-violent offenses, looking at probation anyway, let's get them out. Let's get them working. There's approximately 33,000 people incarcerated right now in the Department of Corrections in the state of Missouri. 80% of the people incarcerated are for non-violent offenses. The CD&E felonies that Leslie is talking about. To incarcerate somebody a year, it's roughly $28,000 of taxpayer dollars. Uh, that doesn't include somebody who needs medical attention, psychological attention, anything like that. That's just the basics. The factors for recidivism, when somebody finds themselves going back to doing something criminal and getting in trouble, mental health, employment, substance abuse, education, you lose almost all of that after being in jail for up to three days, it's gone. Your chances of doing something else happening, they skyrocket. And right now, a lot of you probably heard. Right now, a lot of you probably heard there, there, there's talk of two new prisons to be built in the state of Missouri for billions of dollars. Billions. That doesn't take into account the numbers I've just told you. The numbers, the numbers that I just talked about, and the difference that we can make by seeing a different path for nonviolent offenders who have a chance to become productive members of society or go back into society. There are prison population meetings that are held every single week, okay? The, a member of the judiciary is there, a member from the public defender's office is there, from the private defense bar, our office as well as justice services. And we review 10 to 15 uh, inmates and we're talking low-level, nonviolent inmates who are in the jail to determine whether they should even be there, okay? And what we found is that
prior to us coming in office, there would be, for example, an individual maybe in there on a drug possession case. Justice Services would say, yeah, they need to be out. The public defender or the defense bar, if they had an attorney, would say, yeah, we need to get them out. The judge would say, yeah, let's get them out. And then the prosecutor's office would say, no, nope, we might give them jail time. And now that person is, is, is going to stay in jail. Well, obviously, we changed that. Right and so now, as a result, as a result, in just three months, we've, we've decreased the prison population for nonviolent offenders by 12%. since 2002. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. I know Josh is going to be in just about every single week. So according to that, I was taking a trial and received a death sentence. Um, I was incarcerated for 32 years. I've been home for almost seven years. Uh, people don't think that what happened to me actually happened
Is that not amen? Amen. Uh, a young man uh, was molested by his teacher, allegedly. I guess I have to say that. Um, and the end of it, the young man um, told um, his teachers or even law enforcement at that time, and the um, the case was not prosecuted. Um, the, you know, I, I won't get into the details of why it wasn't prosecuted, but it wasn't. We all uh, know. No, no, it's, it's not what you think. It's just, it, it's not what you think, but that's not the point of the story. And so once we got in office and we found out about it, um, we obviously immediately worked with uh, the detectives, um, and we got that case filed, and that individual uh, was incarcerated. Now... While incarcerated and waiting for trial, um, this individual um, tried to get one of his uh, cellmates, who was getting out soon, to murder not only the young man, but his mother too. This individual, who in my eyes is a hero, came to our office and told us and gave us the information. We, we worked with law enforcement from St. Louis County. We set up a sting operation, and we and that person is now also charged with murder for hire as well. Come on. So, we know that there are individuals who are trying to use this kind of this kind of testimony to get out of jail, and will make up things. And I think it's on us to make sure that we're not just taking the easy way and saying, you know what, that sounds good, it's going to help my case, so we're just going to work with it, as opposed to vetting it and corroborating it and looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Because far too often, I'm working my case. It's helping, so let's just go with it. And, that, and that's not good enough. And so I think there has to be more scrutiny with that kind of testimony because we know an individual has incentive to lie. Yes. And, if we can't, and if we can't corroborate it, then we shouldn't use it. Right. But I just want to make sure, though, when we can corroborate it and we can rely on it, then we will. And so when the prosecutor withholds evidence, um, something that West campaigned on heavily was transparency and open communication. And so the first weeks before he even took office, we had members of our transition team going in, talking with judges, talking with members of the defense bar, and saying, no, we want, don't want to have a culture where people can't bring us criticism. And we want to have an open dialogue. And because Wesley worked so hard at establishing a trust with the community and with the, with the legal community as well, there have been defense attorneys since we've been in office who've come to us and said, you know, I think this individual prosecutor did something wrong. Um, and, and they share that with us. They were not comfortable bringing that information to the previous administration for a variety of reasons. Um, the times that that's happened, immediately Sam and Wesley met with the attorney individually. And then also, we talked with the entire office to say, this type of practice is not okay. You're now on notice, and if we catch someone doing it again, you're done. We don't just get comments from defense attorneys. We also get letters from Department of Corrections and letters from people in the jail. And we take those letters seriously. We don't just throw them away. We look into every accusation that's made, and we sometimes talk to the attorneys on those cases. Uh, first question is, uh, what is the status of mental health court reform and plans for the next 12 to 18 months? And uh, kind of a two-part question. So status and plans for that for the next 12 to 18 months. And what role does mental health services play um, in um, curing violence? And so we know that one in five Americans are struggling with mental health issues. But when you look at the criminal justice system, you're talking 50 to 60 percent of individuals who come in contact with the justice system are in need of mental health care. And what we saw before, which, um, you, know, you know me, I like to keep it positive, so I don't, yes. don't want to go negative. I'm just going to say what I disagree with. 
And I do not believe, and I disagree with the commitment of the previous administration to these kind of diversion programs. All of their diversion programs are outperforming St. Louis County's uh, diversion programs. Last, in our substance abuse program last year had 75 people. 75. By comparison, Kansas City, half of our population, had over 550. In the mental health court, where we know that half of, at least half the people are need of, in need of mental health care, we had 12 people. 12 people in the mental health doctor. That's unacceptable. All right, say how you doing, man? Thank you all for coming out on Color Change event. This is one of a uh, big event, man. Color Change, St. Louis Reform, County Reform Coalition. Uh, we put together an amazing event that brought together so many collaborative parts of our community, local, national, regional partners that really affect the change. When you look at, at 100 days of justice, you'll be able to see that not only did we bring, not only the community together, we were able to bring together collaborative partners to create such an impact is going to change generations. So when we look at this event, this is not just 100 days, this is 100 days, 100 hours, 100 minutes from now. What will you do in your community to help change for justice? This is bigger than just a county prosecutor. This is big about us as a nation, a one nation. So we issue a one nation challenge. What will you do in the next 10 hours, in the next 10 days, in the next 10 weeks, in the next 10 minutes even, to change your community? We want to thank you for coming out to 100 Days of Justice. I'm Daniel Poole, Missouri Faith Impact. Thank you. Have a nice.